morning, Nashville Vineyard and friends. I hope everyone's doing great today. We're going to spend some time in worship, and then we're going to have a sermon. It's going to be a great morning. So I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, just position yourself before the Lord and say, Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pray, and we're going to get started. So, Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit to come, to be with us. We lay our hearts before you. We love you, Jesus. All of this is for you. All of this is for you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us, for rising again, for making a way so that we can have access to the Father. So we come before you, God, with praise and thanksgiving, and we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name.
This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. This is a house of
on you this morning, God. Come and have your way in our lives, in our hearts. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus, full surrender, your Lordship. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Hi, everybody. I'm Ken Fish, and I'm here at the Nashville Vineyard today. Uh, today's sermon is going to be about something that you, maybe you haven't heard about so much in recent times. I'm going to be talking to you about fasting, which, uh, as the old joke goes, there is no such thing as a fast. They're really actually quite slow. Um, but I want to talk about consecrating a fast, and I want to talk to you today um, about fasting from the book of Joel, which is in the Old Testament, and he's a minor prophet. We don't often speak from the minor prophets in church today, and we're going to look at a number of shorter passages out of Joel in order to uh, frame the conversation. Part of why we have to read more scripture maybe than normal is because many of us are not familiar with this book, and this is really the only way for us to get familiar with the book and to understand where Joel is going with his prophetic word. We don't know a lot about Joel. He was a man who, um, who lived uh, just before the Babylonian invasion of Judah and Benjamin in the southern kingdom. So he's in the 6th century BC, roughly 2,600 years ago. And, um, and he appears to have been some kind of an agricultural worker, not surprising given the times in which he lived. Most people were either kings and priests or they worked in vineyards and groves and gardens and things. But anyway, um, Joel's word uh, begins with an understanding of a coming plague or, uh, or difficulty associated with locusts. And so I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to be looking away from the camera momentarily and periodically throughout this, this sermon uh, just to keep myself on track and look at my notes. But uh, with that, let's take a look at the book of Joel. So we're going to talk today about consecrating a fast, and I want to start out in Joel chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. And it says this, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, Joel, we say Joel, but Joel in Hebrew, the son of Pethuel. Now, we don't know much about him beyond this, but, but clearly this is a word that came to him, however the word came to him. A lot of times people don't even know what that would mean to recognize the word of the Lord coming to him. We don't know if this is the first word Joel got, or maybe it was a subsequent uh, word later on in his ministry. But anyway, this word got recorded and inscripturated, and that tells us there's something enduring about it. There's something meaningful and lasting for all generations, including ours. And so it goes on and it says, Hear this, you elders and give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? So Joel's trying to get attention. He's trying to call people to pay attention to what he's saying. And he's speaking not only to the leadership, the elders, he's speaking also to all the inhabitants of the land. So it might be easy to say, you know, this is something that God has in mind just for pastors and bishops and apostles and prophets, but no, this is a word for everybody in the land. And he goes on and he says, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. And so Joel is saying, this is such an unusual thing that is going on, so so crazy and strange that this, this will become legacy. This will become one of those things that gets passed on to the third and fourth generation. Now, you know, in, in history and in the story of societies and countries and nations, uh, you know, there are those things that become, well, they become legend. They become storied events and they are captured and told to posterity. All societies have these things. In America, uh, we might think about the ride of Paul Revere being one of those. Or we might talk about George Washington at Valley Forge or the landings at Iwo Jima and the many days of fighting that it took until they finally planted the flag atop Mount Suribachi. I mean, we could go on and on with different events 
Uh, some would be controversial in our time, others less so, but these are the things that make up our story. They're part of our fabric. And Joel is saying this thing that, that he sees coming, this thing he's prophesying about, this is something that will ultimately become part of the fabric and the story of Judah and Benjamin themselves. He goes on and he says in verse 4, he speaks of cutting locusts and swarming locusts and hopping locusts and destroying locusts. And he says, all of these things come in succession, four different waves of destruction through natural means. And, uh, and they, are, they are devastating the land. They're stripping it bare. And then he says, awake you drunkards and weep and wail all you drinkers of wine because of the sweet wine for it is cut off from your, from your mouths. Well, this is, um, you know, this is basically saying the people of God are in a stupor. They, 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 you know, wake up is what Joel is saying in, in colloquial English. Uh, you know, you've, you've had so much excess, so much comfort, so much uh, benefit for so long that you don't even recognize that the tide is turning. And yet Joel, he's sounding the alarm because he sees the coming danger that is upon them. And so uh, I might say there's something of this in the land today that, you know, we've, we've clearly seen the effects of COVID, we've seen the effect of race riots, we've seen the effect of uh, conflict at the highest levels of our government, um, we've seen corruption. Um, it's not always even clear who's corrupt and who isn't, but it's clear there's a lot of corruption. We've seen investigations, on it goes. And so, you know, in the midst of all that, our sensibilities need to be awakened. And yet sometimes we are at ease in Zion, to borrow a phrase from elsewhere in the scripture, and, and we don't actually sense the uh, the moment that we're in. And so Joel is saying to them, wake up. And then he goes on and he talks about a nation coming up against his own, which is referring to Babylon, um, which, you know, at the moment anyway, we don't face imminent invasion as a nation. Uh, but in his time, of course, war was an, it was an additional factor that they were dealing with. So this is the first part of the of the word of Joel, and it's dealing with the times in which they live. It's dealing with the alarm that he needs to sound. It's dealing with the uh, the difficulties uh, that they're facing. All of this is going on, and so Joel is speaking out about this. Well, the book moves on, and it moves to his solution to the problem. It's not enough just to recognize a problem. You've actually got to do something about it. But you might say, how do you stop a plague of locusts? How do, you, how do you stop an invasion by a foreign army that's more powerful than you are? And he goes on and describes just how powerful and effective this army is. I'm not going to go into that part of the word very much. Um, this sermon length doesn't really afford the chance to do that. But, but he does explore it in the book if you want to go read it yourself. But anyway, in, um, in chapter 1, verse 14... Joel uh, speaks about this, and he says, um, well, starting in verse 13, he says, put on sackcloth. Now, sackcloth is basically burlap, and it's very uncomfortable on the skin. It's itchy and scratchy. But the, the reason that we put on sackcloth is as a sign of contrition, as a sign of mourning and sorrow. And so he's saying, you know, don't just say, yeah, you know, sucks to be us. He's saying, you know, do something to show the fact that you are humbling yourselves. Do something outwardly that is visible. So put on sackcloth and lament, O priests, and wail, O ministers of the altar. So the people who attend to the house of the Lord should absolutely be engaged in this. And we might even say leading the, leading the charge in the solution. Go in and pass the night in sackcloth. O ministers of my God. Now, this is speaking of pulling vigil. This is something that they used to do a lot of in the Middle Ages, what we call the Middle Ages. Few people do this anymore unless they're really dedicated intercessors. But I might just throw this out since we're here for a moment, and it'll, it'll gain momentum as we move through this word from Joel. Um, you might want to consider depriving yourself of some sleep for the express purpose of staying up late and praying to the Lord and seeking his face. I'm not saying you do this for weeks and months on end, but Joel is clearly suggesting this. He's saying, pass the night in sackcloth. Well, to pass the night in sackcloth means you're awake 
and you are praying through the night in this sackcloth clothing, this uncomfortable clothing you put on as a sign of humiliation. And the reason you're doing it is because the grain offerings have been cut off from the house of the Lord. Well, I mean, some churches today are are struggling financially due to the conditions we're in. Others seem to be thriving. So I don't think you can uniformly say that this is a thing in our land, but it's not, it's also not a thing. It's also not not a thing, is I think the way to say that. Um, some churches really are under the gun. And so when we speak of these things, we are uh, talking about the, the impact of the wider societal distress on the in specific institution in Joel's day of, of the temple, and I could say in our day of the impact on the wider church which in many ways is struggling, uh, maybe compromised, weakened um, in the cases where money is not flowing and they're struggling to pay their bills and you know keep their lights on and so forth. Well, then that too is a thing. But the point is, you know, the church is never fully separated from the, the difficulties and conflict of the society in which she lives. Yes, we're the people of God. And yes, we have a particular blessing on us that God wants to bestow because God favors his own. That's true. But the the fact is we live amidst a people and the, the rising and falling of the people in, among whom we live will ultimately impact us ourselves at some very basic level. And this is what Joel is pointing to. But he goes on, don't just put on sackcloth and stay up you know, most or all of the night praying. That's important, and it's a takeaway action point. But he goes on in verse 14, and he says, Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So he's talking about the people of God coming together to seek the Lord with fasting, meaning the absent, uh, abstinence from food. And sometimes people wonder, you know, what does a fast mean? And you'll hear people talk about fasting from chocolate or wine or whatever. And, you know, I think I think any fast can have power. But biblically, when we speak of fasting, most commonly what we're talking about is the complete abstinence from food. And biblically, when we will talk about a day of fasting, we would talk about sundown on the day previous to sundown on the day succeeding which ultimately means, if you think about it, that you do get to eat dinner, albeit after dark, on the day that the, uh, or excuse me, you eat breakfast and lunch on the day the fast begins, but then the sun goes down and you skip dinner. The following day, you don't eat breakfast or lunch, but you do get to eat dinner after the sun goes down. That is a one-day fast in the biblical framework. And listen, if you live in America, you're probably mildly overweight anyhow. Nothing is going to kill you to skip dinner and then breakfast and lunch and then resume dinner. You can actually do this. It may not be your favorite thing to do. You may be hungry. You may be, uh, you know, you, you may have cravings. But in the end, it is possible to do this. And so this is what Joel is saying, that we need to consecrate a fast. Consecrate means to make holy. Set the day aside. Make it, make it a holy day. Now, it could be, you know, Jesus talks about when you fast, don't put on sackcloth and you know, put on an air so that everyone knows you're fasting. Instead, just go about your business, anoint your head with oil, comb your hair, you know, shave, take a shower, be presentable. Um, so do your fasting in secret. I, I would say following the instruction of Jesus, we don't necessarily need to, you know, go into work looking like a hobo. Um, but we but we do in our internal life have an have a posture of fasting and we hold this before the Lord as part of where a part of what we're doing in our consecration, and we've made this a special day. So this is what Joel is talking about, and he says that we should cry out to the Lord. He goes on, he uses this exact language later on in the book, in chapter 2, verse uh, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. So we, we've heard that language already. Blowing the trumpet can mean many things, but most particularly here, blowing the trumpet is a sound of alarm. It's a sound of danger. It's a sound of warning. So we're talking about a shofar, a ram's horn. So we blow the alarm to alert people and to awaken them out of that very stupor that Joel had spoken of. Even now, God says, blow the trumpet in Zion and consecrate a fast. There's the same word and language. 
Call a solemn assembly and gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even the nursing infants. So bring everybody to this fast, even babes that are still nursing. Bring them along. Bring the little kids along. Let the bridegroom leave his chamber and uh, his room and the bride her chamber. So this is a euphemism for saying, for a day anyway, abstain from marital relations. And, you know, Paul talks about this in the New Testament. This is also a New Testament concept. When he writes to the Corinthians and he says, a man and a wife should not deprive themselves of their marital function, um, but they can agree to do so for a limited period of time in order that they would consecrate themselves to the word of God and to prayer, but then come back together again, lest you be tempted by your abstinence. And so... Um, I might even throw it out there. I know it's a little bit crazy, and I'm not trying to be pervy here, but uh, you might actually, if you're married, if you're unmarried, it goes without saying you should be abstinent. But if you're married, you might want to talk with your spouse about, you know, for the duration of this fast or some defined period within it, um, we will abstain from sexual relations for the purpose of dedicating ourselves entirely to the purposes of God. This is not an unheard of concept, by the way. Even just before the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, Joshua went through the camp and said to the Israelites, abstain from sexual relations for three days because we're about to cross over and I want you to consecrate yourselves unto the task of, of the fight that is ahead of us. And so there, there is biblical precedent for this. Again, no one really talks about it. It's not a very popular thing to talk about, but it is a real thing. And remember that fasting... Part of its purpose is to subjugate the flesh, to bring it into submission. Paul says, I beat my body and bring it into submission, lest after having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified from the prize. The flesh always wants to rise up. It always wants to give expression to its appetites. And yet there are times when we have to say, no, you flesh, just be quiet. This is a time of my intense focus on God. So Paul uses this language in 1 Corinthians. All right, so let's go back to the book of Joel. So he's talking about consecrating a fast. He's talking about it being a, a food fast, apparently a sexual fast. Um, this is the summons. And then it goes on and it says in uh, chapter 2, verse 18, and then, then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answer and answered and said to his people, behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. So if stage one was the alarm that Joel sounded, stage two is the fast, and we've defined the parameters of the fast. Stage three is that God hears fasting. God hears fasting. And so the Lord took note of what was being said. That's what we read in chapter two, verse 13. Then the Lord became jealous for his land. God heeded and hearkened unto the word, or excuse me, the fast that the people had entered into with their elders and leaders. And so his heart is moved. And, you know, we see this throughout the pages of Scripture, the power of fasting. I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, the crossing of the Jordan River by Joshua and how they fasted for three days before they went to war and God gave them victory over their enemies, both at Ai and at Jericho. But we also know the story of Jehoshaphat. It's found in um, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. A lot of times we don't preach so much out of these uh, books of history in the Old Testament, but Jehoshaphat was being set upon by a foreign army and he called the whole nation to fast. Jehoshaphat was an pretty good king for the most part. He didn't choose his friends very well, but but he followed God. And when he called the nation to fast, uh, God heard their prayers and their fasting. I should say their prayers mixed with fasting. That'd probably be a better way to say it. And he rescued them. He delivered them. And so this too is an example from scripture. You can look that one up for yourself if you like later on. That's again, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. And let's not forget Esther. When Esther was informed about the plot that Haman had to commit genocide against all of the Jews who were held in captivity during the reign of the Persian kings, <clears throat> 
She said to her uncle Mordecai, spread the word throughout the Jewish community to call a three-day fast. And all of the people fasted and God delivered them. That's, that's basically the story of Esther. I mean, there's so much more we could say, but that's not our focus today. I'm just using it as an illustration. So we see again and again through the pages of scripture that when the people of God mix prayer with fasting, great breakthroughs occur. I want to underscore that. Great breakthroughs occur when prayer is mingled with fasting. And Joel says something else as part of this whole prophecy. Um, he says in uh, verse 17 that the, when the people come together, they, they should do it, he says, 217, between the vestibule and the altar. Well, vestibule is not a term we use very often, but in a modern church, we would call it the lobby or the narthex or the area outside the sanctuary. But the altar, of course, is the area right down at the front where the communion table is or the cross is hung or whatever. So he's saying in the area where the people commonly sit, in the pew area, you know, gather the people and let them fast and pray there. Well, they could do that in the temple. Today, a lot of our churches are still closed with COVID. It might not be possible literally to gather in that way, maybe. On the other hand, if your church could do it, that would be a good thing to do, to gather in the pews and fast and pray together and call out to the Lord. I know, uh, you know, gathered assembled prayer is not probably high on your favorite list of things to do, again, unless you're an intercessor. But in times of emergency, it's the right thing to do. And so Joel is suggesting this. Now, if we can't do that because our own churches are closed and you know where a church might be doing this thing, well, maybe go join with them for that period of time. Or just do it in your home with your husband or wife or children. Or if you live alone, then just do it on your own. Do, do what you can, but do something. I think that's the takeaway. Do, what, do something. So um, he says, gather between the vestibule and the altar. Let the priest and the ministers of the Lord weep and say, spare your people, O Lord. So here we're being given the very words to pray. Spare your people, O Lord. And if your heart is so moved, such that tears come to your eyes, don't hold them back. Don't try to staunch the tears. Instead, let them flow freely. Um, I think we also live in a time where, you know, people are uncomfortable sometimes with emotion publicly displayed. But um, but in scripture, weeping moves the heart of God. It's, it's a sign that our hearts are tender and open toward him. So if that happens to you, well, go for it. All right, so, and, and make not your heritage your reproach. In other words, don't let us be mocked, don't let us be ridiculed. We are your inheritance, and, and so rescue us, God. And that thus we become a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? So, you know, one of, the, one of the great risks that the church faces, that the people of God in the Old Testament faced, is that people will actually say, you know, all this religion, it's a bunch of nonsense and hokum. Uh, there's really nothing to it. And I, I, I think sometimes even Christians fall into this. We're like, well, we prayed a long time. We've seen no breakthrough. Um, you know, it doesn't seem to work. Uh, maybe it question, causes us to question our faith, or maybe it causes us to question, well, maybe God doesn't want to do this one. Maybe God doesn't want to bring us breakthrough in this case. But either way, these are, these are what happened to the heart when we're trying to guard our heart from disappointment, and it actually becomes, it migrates from disappointment to unbelief. And when it crystallizes, it actually causes us to remain in a state of disaffection toward God. We want to break through that. That's why tears can be so powerful if they come. But even if they don't come, um, we want to pray as Joel instructed us to pray. He says, spare your people, O Lord. That's our primary prayer. Spare us, God. Rescue us. Have mercy upon us. And so um, this, is our, this is stage three of what Joel is laying out. Again, stage one was the alarm being sounded. Stage two is fasting, the call to fasting. Stage three is the response, both on God's part and our own. So there's a human and a divine component to this. And then finally it moves on in 225, and it says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army that was sent among you. So God says that when we fast in the way that we're describing, God will actually come and bring um, restoration where there has been a stripping away. And, you know, money can be put back in the bank. Health can be restored. 
conflict can be resolved. I mean, whatever restoration means in whatever dimension it needs to come, this is a possibility, and it's not just a possibility. Rather, God says, I will. God says, it is my desire, it is my intention, and I will do it. Why? Because you have partnered with me in prayer, with fasting. This is the power of fasting. It moves heaven by moving us, and we are moved because heaven is moved. Again, it's a divine partnership between humans and God, and it's most powerful when many are engaged in it. That's why the emphasis on gathering the entire congregation from the young to the old. And I might even say, if you have children, I mean, they won't like it and they'll complain and whine, and you might too. <laughs> uh, have them participate in the fast. Maybe you don't want to deprive your children of three meals, but maybe have them skip one or give them a light meal anyway. But have your children participate in this. This is part, part of how we raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, in the disciplines of the Lord. And if we've never fasted with our children, I would say we've never actually raised them well in the things of God. So think about how that might apply if you have children. All right, so that's that's uh, step four. So we've gone from alarm to fasting to response to restoration. And stage five, the last stage in Joel's prophecy, is outpouring and, it, and where it said, I will restore to you. And he goes on and talks about what that restoration looks like. Then in 228, one of the most famous lines in the entire Bible that gets quoted by Peter the Apostle at Pentecost he goes on and he says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now it's interesting because, you know, a lot of us are believing for a great outpouring. We're a great visitation of God. We're waiting for that, you know, for God to come and bring revival to our nation or our nations. If we, you know, we may live not just in the United States, depends how far this broadcast goes. But you know, this outpouring of the Spirit comes after the first four steps. It doesn't just happen. And I think some people believe that, you know, it's just going to be this sort of whammo, the Holy Spirit hit and revival was on and bang, it was awesome. But actually the scripture doesn't seem to suggest that. It seems that there is a, a recognition of the problem. That was the sounding of the alarm. Um, then the fasting is the response that we take on to supercharge our prayers that leads to a divine response and a promise of restoration. And on the back end of that restoration, then there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it goes on and says that God will put his spirit on all flesh. Now, this is all believing flesh. It's just, the Holy Spirit doesn't come on in this way, non-believers. I mean, he can come on them for conviction. He can at times maybe confront them as he did Paul on the Damascus Road, although I, I would argue that's an unusual outlier. Um, but this is actually referring to believers. The Holy Spirit will come upon all believers and he will pour out his spirit on all flesh so that the sons and the daughters shall prophesy. So the gifts of the spirit will be flowing on men and women. The old men, and we could say the old women, they will dream dreams. Why? Well, maybe they take cat naps in the middle of the day because they're a little more tired and a little more elderly. But the old men will dream dreams and the young men will see visions, even on the male and female servants. So you, these aren't even the free people. I mean, this is, this is talking about the, the, you know, kind of the servant class and maybe even the slaves, that the Spirit of God will be poured out upon them not so much because of their station in life. I mean, if they're servants and slaves, they're not the highborn. But nevertheless, this gift of the Holy Spirit can be given to them, and he will be poured out upon them on all flesh. And he says, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and then I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And so on it goes. So a lot of us are looking for that outpouring, and I would say, you know, one of the things we need to do is we need to fast. All right, well, I want to make this quite practical and pointed, so I'm going to uh, land this sermon now, but I want, to, I want to tell you what the action point is. On the 13th of October, which is this coming Tuesday, uh, there is a nationwide fast that is being consecrated. There are 200 apostolic leaders who have come together to, to in you know, joint convocation to summon the people of God in the United States of America to fast for our nation for three weeks and so on the 13th of October, we will be exactly three weeks from Election Day. So the duration of the fast that we're calling for is from the 13th of October, which is Tuesday, until the 3rd of November, 
which is also a Tuesday and is also election day. And uh, in that, we will fast and we are trying to gather 20 million Christians across the United States to fast and to pray for America and say, spare your people, O God, just like Joel said to do. Now, our goal is that if you can, fast for 21 days on water. Some won't be able to do that. You could be diabetic. You may have health issues. Okay, if you can't do that, then modify your fast as you need to. I could give a whole teaching on how to do that. And if you want me to, I'll just refer you to a YouTube video I did on this very topic on my YouTube channel, Ken Fish. You can go watch that for more information. But whether you fast water only for 21 days or you do a day-to-day -day fast and each night you eat some dinner to replenish you for the next day, however you're going to do it, for 21 days fast coming into the election for one purpose, spare your people. What we want is not that Donald Trump would win or Joe Biden would win. I mean, one of them is going to win. But what we're fasting for is that we would have peaceable and quiet lives, that we can pursue godliness as Paul the Apostle wrote to Timothy. So we're asking for God to give us domestic tranquility. No burning, no rioting, no upheavals, no coups, uh, no refusal to abdicate office if Trump loses, or a refusal to concede if Trump wins. I mean, however it goes, but we want peace in our land because we've had enough upheaval and turmoil. And so this is, this is the action point. I'm joining as one of these 200 leaders, and I, you, whoever watching this video, I'm calling you to fast from the 13th of October to the 3rd of November unto peace in our land. And I believe if we will do that, 20 million Christians across the United States seeking the face of God and asking him to have mercy on us, he will answer us and our nation will be spared great upheaval and social unrest. Thanks for watching today. God bless you.